actually, the second session and the third session are going to run a bit together because it's all about success. And I've been asked to talk about how to value your company, and it doesn't really matter how to value your company if your company is not going to be successful. And your biggest job to be, not your biggest, but a major job to be successful is to secure the resources you need to grow your company. The only reason to talk about valuation is as a mechanism for attracting resources to your company. Those resources may be technology, it may be people, it may be money. And in any case, those resources may want a win-win relationship with you. As we suggested earlier, there's one sure win-win relationship I know, which is sharing the upside. The simplest way to share the upside, but the most long-term and most irrevocable, in other words, a marriage that's very hard to get out of, is sharing equity ownership. There are other ways to share upside. You can have a contract that gives a royalty right. You can have a contract that shares top line, bottom line, middle line, whatever. But when you share equity ownership, you're just sort of there, stuck together. Now, as we heard from counsel earlier, yeah, you see you can have prenups. She didn't call them that. You can have deals set into the structure that give you the opportunity to buy them out or buy you out and all sorts of ways to unlock these transactions. And of course, hopefully we saw embedded in those agreements the implicit impossibility of, them, of doing them almost without litigation. Because if you remember, counsel said, well, of course, any exit is going to be based at fair market value. <laughs> Your opinion of fair market value, my opinion of fair market value are opinions until somebody puts up the money. And in a court of law, it's only a bunch of opinions. Your opinion, the other side's opinion, your expert's opinion, their expert's opinion, then the expert of the expert's opinion. Then we hire Pritchard, the Pritchard folks to come in and give us their opinion. Of course, they're right. In other words, there is no right answer to valuation except when there is a transaction and cash actually exchanges hands. So no contract can stipulate value. No. Um, professor standing in front of you can tell you how to calculate value. There are internal and external drivers of value. There are the intrinsic internal factors, you know, number of customers, sales, whatever attributes you want to attach to value. And then there are the externals, because you could have all these internals, you know, churn, ARPU, DARPU, MARPU, CARPU. I'm making some of those terms up. Well, you know, metrics, and you can have comps, and we're going to talk a lot about comps. But then there's the external stuff, like, oh my god, it's raining. The President of the United States tweeted something absurd. Whatever disrupts the world. And value gets disrupted by something way outside of your control. So valuation is not just your, any formula I could give you about internal metrics, has, has much to do with external perceptions of stability and beta, you know, beta, risk, volatility, et cetera. So what am I going to talk about for an hour? I'm going to talk about tools to help you get the resources you need. Because again, the valuation process is only an element of a transaction to help you get technology, money, and people. Now, you would probably expect me to just say money, money, and money. But in my world, I find the sharing of equity a way to structure win-win in gaining any kind of resource. And the critical resource is, first of all, is not money. It's often really access to know-how. That know-how either stands alone in perfected IP that may be in sitting in some university, or may be embedded in the knowledge and capability of key people you want to retain. And if you're going to retain them over a long period of time, you're going to share ownership with them. I don't know exactly what structure you, you will choose. You may choose something as simple as an incentive stock option. But embedded in an incentive stock option arrangement is valuation. Because you issue it at a price, it gets exercised at a price, it gets liquid at a third price. 
Now, I can talk about it, and I will theoretically, but as valuable or more valuable will be the practical points of view of investors, because investors actually do transactions that involve valuation. So these empty chairs will be filled. Joe Barber, Jordan Green, Bob Beaumont, three very experienced investors. They're going to, res they're going to reflect for us their approach to structuring transactions that allow you to get some of the resources you need and how their transactions leverage other transactions. For instance, how an investor setting value on a transaction allows you to use that value for hiring employees or talking to your bank or other things. So it doesn't stand just alone as itself but it anchors into a whole universe, a whole context of thinking. So we're going to get them up here as soon as I make 98 critical points that you need to remember to take notes. So what are the critical points that I want to make? One of the critical points is mechanically, if you will, looking more deeply into the journey you're going to take and the transaction at, transactions at each stage where value may play a role. Now, this curve is intuitive, but there's also some refined elements of truth that may not be obvious. This curve comes from a conversation that I had about 20 years ago with Professor John Freeman in my office at the University of California, Berkeley. Bob, you remember John. Fine man. And the context is, John comes in from Cornell University, really a refined, you know, a highly sought after academic, just recruited back to Berkeley where he had spent his formative years. Jerry is the pracademic in the world here. In other words, you saw my background. Nothing in that background showed you a research PhD with blah, blah, blah. No, I'm a a you know, venture capital investor, an entrepreneur, even an accountant, right? But I'm a pracademic. I come from the practical side. But I had this position of being the chair of this entrepreneurship endeavor at the University of California, Berkeley. John comes in my office, and he's going to be my peer relationship, but he's the real academic, and I'm the imitation. And he says, <clears throat> OK, nice to meet you, Jerry. If you know so much, he didn't really looked down his nose at me, but he essentially said, in different words, if you know so much about this, you should be able to explain it to me in a few sentences. Well, I had to meet that challenge, and I simply said, <clears throat> John, I can do better. And I took, oh, my goodness, I took, was that not behind me the whole time I was talking? Here's what I meant. I took a piece of paper, put it on the wall, and drew a line. And that line went down and it went up. And what did that mean? It simply meant, well, John, it's obvious. This is cash flow at zero. Any entrepreneurial venture, any innovation of significance is going to consume resources before it generates resources. Anything that generates resources as soon as you deploy it is not an innovation. It must be just the economic exploitation of a given understanding of value. That's not innovation. So that discussion lasts about 12 years. You know, this is the university. So, you know, we revisit this chart literally for years and years. And somewhere down here, there's a citation. Oh, it's not on this chart. But we end up writing an article that gets very well cited about that chart. How much truth could there be in that chart? Well, this is a different chart than a major corporation draws. It never draws this chart, even though it lives this reality, you know, in individual projects. Because this chart reflects something other than simply spending money before you make money. It represents the fact that you spend money at different rates. That here you spend as little money as you can, stretching as long as you can to learn as much as you can until you get to a point where you come to a point of commitment. At that point, you believe you know what you're doing. Here, you might have believed you knew what you were doing. But if you're good, you understood that it was a guess. 
Now, most of us, when we start our businesses, don't like to think it's a guess, and we assert that we know, and we get out there and talk about things as if we know them to be true. That conversation starts, usually starts with somebody saying, how many people in the room have ever wanted to, bum, 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 and then it goes on to, well, of course we all have this need, and here's the solution. Just invest in me. See, I know what I'm doing. Fact is, it should start off with saying, I really don't know what I'm doing, but I'm hoping that a significant number of people have this need, and I don't know if I can really meet that need with this solution, but it's going to take me three years, maybe four or five, to build this solution, and I'm going to test incrementally along the way whether I, in fact, can develop product market fit and velocity around this business. Oh, invest in me. Doesn't sound as good, does it? But, in fact, that's really what a good entrepreneur knows, that they don't know. And they know that they're on a long journey. So they want to extend this period of learning as long as they can, because that's when they have ultimate flexibility. They're going to take some money. They're going to take some money from the government. No commitment there. They're going to take some money from people willing to take this kind of total risk. Those three people over there, probably to help in that exploration of discovery to get to the point where it's worth limiting your options and saying, we know what we're doing now. Now we're going to not just start. You maybe at this point have 100 customers, 50 customers, whatever, some velocity. So you're a real business. I'm not saying that's not a business. But you're not burning every penny you have. And here, you cross the level of commitment and your job as CEO is not to retain cash any longer, but it's to spend cash, to acquire cash, to acquire people as fast as you can, and spend it as fast as you can, as long as it's building the enterprise to acquire customers and retain customers. Because you want to monopolize that first initial beachhead market. You're not going after the world. You're not looking for 2% of all Coca-Cola drinkers. You're looking for a specific niche application of your solution against a compelling need. Once you monopolize and own that space and you are known as being the very best in the world at this simple thing, yeah, then you can go to adjacencies and recreate this cycle of investment over and over again as you go, like Amazon did, or pick your favorite example, from adjacency to adjacency to adjacency. So there's strategy embedded in the thinking. What do you do if this is a not a lecture about valuation, even though it got billed that way, it's really a lecture about resource acquisition and using valuation strategies to achieve that. What does that look like? Well, as you go from pure entrepreneurship of discovery to the strategic focus, where you're doing only one thing and doing it very well, and then someday somebody's going to build systems so you can have redundancy and controls and corporate management, et cetera. If you're going through that journey, what you're actually doing is the job that we saw from legal counsel. I love, thank you very much for borrowing my earlier slide and greasing the three wheels. I appreciate it. That these wheels that you're greasing is acqu are acquiring different resources here than the resources here. The point of your job as an entrepreneur is to secure those resources, right? Identifying the opportunity is easy. Securing the resources is hard. And especially since the resources are different for the, for the different stages. So it's not just hard to raise money or hard to hire the right people or hard to get the right IP. It's hard to know what resources you can afford to build incrementally towards success. So the people you hire on day one are different than the people you hire when you have 100 employees. The money you recruit on day one is different than the money you recruit when you have 100 employees. And all along the way, your job is in securing those resources is to be a storyteller, to vision the story. So that here, when you're getting your first three and five and 10 employees, you're telling them, this is the roadmap, like you know what you're doing. This is our journey. This is where we're going. But you have to look about the future, right? Because the value is not there today. So that visioning exercise is a demonstration of your strategic 
thinking. So this is a discussion about valuation, right? Yes, it is, because you're going to say, given my understanding of where we're going, this is the total capital resource I'm going to need to cover that gap. It's going to be in X, Y, Z steps. The valuation of each step is going to be from this range to that range. We're going to give up or trade out 40 or 50 or 70% of the ownership that these types of partners come along on the journey with me. So they're not surprises. You should be thinking this journey through. So the value creation process is often one of creating tangible and intangible capabilities in the areas of product or technology, marketing, and management competency. And the benchmarks you're going to work against in each of these areas will vary depending on your industry and what you're doing. But the key is that you identify steps in each of these. And then you measure how you deploy to achieve those objectives and how much capital they require and the time. And that leads to an overall journey that you map out as having some prediction. Council suggested we call that a business plan. I won't argue over the definition of the terminology, but that wouldn't be a bad term to describe a future vision of the journey. The key is that we're identifying steps that we're going to hit. And we agree on the definition of them. All these are vague terms, but we use them all the time. We need traction. What the hell does that mean? Is that one employee? I mean, one customer? Is that 100 customers? Is it customers at the appropriate margin? What's the retention, et cetera? Oh, I need traction. Oh, then I need market traction, which means I'm gaining customers. Or I need scale validation, which means I'm gaining customers at a rate for this level of investment and this kind of sales and distribution, and the algorithm's really working. But each of these steps might have different investors, new investors, entering the investor family. While all investors initially here would be going along for the ride or participating incrementally, you're getting new investors who have an appetite for a different type of risk at each stage. And that gets reflected probably in a series of financing. Now, this is a theoretical pro forma, but it's what you will find when you look around the entrepreneurial world. Some of you will never need. I mean, the discussion today only went through Series A. You know, I was having a heartache because in my world, seed financings are tough, but they're easily, you know, relatively easy doable. And of every deal that's seed financed, probably half of them can raise the Series A. But in my neck of the woods, the Series B is really hard. And getting the Series A is no indication of success in getting the Series B. And probably only half or a third of the companies that get the Series A get the Series B. So the, it was a great point made by one of the speakers about the valley of death. And that speaker made the point. He hated his own slide because that valley of death is always there, right? It always seems to be the next step that has that valley of death that you have to get across. Nothing's easy in this game. But the point of this slide is just when we talk about valuation, you want to have a secure valuation, you will have, you will predict these steps. And your ability to predict the step and achieve the result will reduce the external perception of risk relative to your projection. And when you reduce the perception of risk relative to your venture, you reduce a discount factor. So if you wanted to think of value as being a future stream of cash or earnings, discounted back to the present by discount factors that reflect not just the cost of capital, but the cost of risk in general, reducing the perception of risk is essential. So it's not only important that you, you know, get early validation, but that you've stipulated what that means, and you've told people in advance well, my expectation is that in four months, I'm going to have three contracts out of these 10 prospects. Three of them are going to close in the, the contracts. And they're going to be at some, this is what they're going to look like in general. And that will validate that those three customers out of 10 value my 
offering, and I product market fit at least demonstrated initially. And when you, in fact, achieve that somewhat within the time frame you predicted, your next prediction is given a higher likelihood of realization. So your value is not based only on the absolute metrics, but the likelihood that your next metric is going to be realized. Now, what those metrics are that are relevant to you depends on comparable comps, again. Because who are you? How do you measure yourself? What are you measuring yourself against? And I don't even want to go beyond this slide before I say, you know, in this whole discussion of securing resources, as important or more important than valuation is the terms of the money, not just the money and the value that it comes in at, but on what terms. We're not going to go through a whole structuring this morning about common stock, preferred stock, liquidation preferences, participating preferred, you know, multiple caps on different uh, elements of the participation, et cetera. But just understand the algorithm of the payout is as important as the metric around which the payout occurs. Do you get paid in dollar for dollar equally with your pro rata, with your investors, or do they get their money back first before you see anything? If they get their money back first, do they continue to participate pro rata with you or not? That's not, there's no given one answer. There are traditional cultural norms and that's one of the things we can ask our investor panels. What are the cultural norms in your world? So you roll through this cap table building. A key element for you in thinking about valuation that this slide is meant to in inform is that it's a given that you, as an early stage individual, will have a decreasing ownership. Period. Get over it. You need to believe in the religion of value creation. And what you're creating is not something you will control by votes, but something you will control by the power of your wisdom, of your management capability, and your personal benefit will be that as the business builds value, you will retain enough of it that you've changed your life forever and the life of your children forever, that you've built wealth that will be liquid and transferable over generations. Much more important than owning the business. Owning the business is simply a problem. The goal is value creation. So this math works out to demonstrate that you know, founder A that ended up, you know, started off with $1,000 worth of value, ends up with $1 million worth of value. So it's math. A key driver in this algorithm is intrinsic to entrepreneurship, and you're going to hate it. The process is you succeed, you meet your benchmark, the more money's raised, the higher valuation. It doesn't always happen that way. A significant number of times you fail to win. Doesn't mean the business is wiped out, but it may mean that the next financing really punishes you in terms of your ownership stake or in terms of your access to liquidity when it's achieved. You don't deliver the results you promised and you need to raise more money, it's not going to come in at a higher valuation. It's going to disappoint you, but you may need to accept it in order to keep the business viable. That's a huge motivator. I don't want any of you to have to experience it. But just the fact that it may happen creates a, uh, an incentive, if you will, a negative incentive that big corporations do not have available to them. Big corporations cannot threaten their employees with the fact that, you know what, if you don't you know, succeed, we're cutting your salary in half and we're taking your pension away. And in fact, we may fire you. They just, you have other options. Society prohibits that. Entrepreneurs do not get that protection. But that vulnerability drives 24 7 behaviors that are different than you ever see in a corporate environment. All you corporates in the room who think you work hard, I got a surprise for you. You do work hard, it's called professional behavior. 
Entrepreneurial behavior is not professional behavior. It's not unprofessional, but it's a personal commitment to performance that goes beyond anything you can understand in a corporate context. Because the risk of failure and the pain of failure is a different level of pain. Why is that good? Everybody hates me, you can leave now. Why is that good? It's, from a societal point of view, it's good in a cluster of innovation because human beings have a problem. The problem is no matter how bright you are, you can only learn so fast. It's called your learning curve. I don't care how bright you are, you have some limit, speed limit, on your ability to gain data and integrate that into patterns so you can make future decisions instantaneously like you're driving down the road and somebody jumps in front of you and you know what to do without saying, what do I do? No, it happens. Where do you get those embedded skills? You get them from experience. Oh, does that mean I would need to go out and hire some big corporate dude to come in and help me run my, no. Because that big corporate dude, whoever she or he is, He's going to come in and do all the wrong things. They're going to say, where's my secretary? <laughs> where's the copy machine? I want to send my secretary to make copies. You know, a, we don't have an office. Oh, there are no secretaries. There's no copy machine. There's no, cop there's no printer. Because we don't operate that slowly. We mo operate virtually. Everybody works from home. It's the this person is not going to operate well in your environment. Right? So the answer is, not that you don't bring in new people, but they are a very limited set of appropriate people at the appropriate time. There are people who've been down your road before. So it's not some big corporate executive from the bank. It's not an eye banker. It's somebody who's been exactly in your shoes, but has done it two or three times before. They're going to demand a certain equity stake. You're going to have to share your ownership with them. But you're going to be incentivized to do that because you need to get up the learning curve. You need the organization to get up the learning curve. So fear of death gives you the freedom to make that decision, OK, this dude can have 5% of my company on a four-year vest. Doesn't get it automatically, or she doesn't get it automatically. They got to work with me for four years to earn it. But bingo, I'm going to break this problem. Because success leads to more complexity than you can manage, right? Failure doesn't lead to that kind of complexity, right? What I'm calling failure is growing 10% a year. You grow 10% a year, you can run this business. You grow 500% a year, unless you've been down this road before to anticipate the challenges of what 500% compounded on 500% means, you need help. So. The way you get help is by getting the right players involved, and you change the game. And this will happen several times throughout the growth of a company. It's not going to happen just once. And having the right structures embedded allow you to do this. In order to do the right structures, you have to have a constant evaluation. So the thing that you, these are the 10 things you need to be able to do in the entrepreneurial model. I don't want to take you through this now in depth. I can refer you to a place you can read all about it. But you don't really have to read about it. I'll send you the slides. They're going to be available. But the things in green, any company can do. Not so easy, but they can do them. Invest in markets, invest in teams, all the right stuff. The things a big company cannot do once it works, pour it on. Big companies don't make change of direction decisions. They, a decision has to go through committees. It gets to levels. It gets to the board. You commit to a plan. You're committed to that plan. You don't come in the next month and say, oh, you know, we learned different stuff for changing direction. No. That would have to go through committees, go through the thing, back to the board. Somebody would get fired along the way. You'd fake it until you made it. You know how that works. It's like, oh, we're doing well, but I'm going to transfer to the Portland office. Excuse me. You know, boom. That's this no lifeboat. The best and brightest are always moving from project to project every two years. They don't stick with anything until it gets hard. 
right? There's a lifeboat for the best people. But the entrepreneurs have nowhere to go. You remember signed that 10-year lifelong marriage contract with your investors. So everybody wants to be there. We mentioned that earlier. If you can't figure it out, this is where you end up. I got a couple coffee cups in my office you want to come by. That's all that's left of these people. So their solution that they've latched on to is open innovation. But this is your salvation. The terminology was coined, well, venture capital is one salvation, right? But this goes hand in hand with it. And this was termed, uh, coined by um, Henry Chesbrough. I always call him Hank. I got to stop myself and go, Professor Henry Chesbrough, right? And he came up with this as a terminology to deal with this problem. Problem is, again, change much faster than the organization can respond. The organization, even when it's working on transition, sort of go through a slow cycle. It might take 18 months, even at the fastest. And here we are going, oh my god, the banking business is going away. My customers don't want to go to branches. They don't want to even use currency. They want to use um, you know, virtual currencies. They want to use bah, 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 bah. So Africa leads the way, M-Pesa, right? We're actually way behind the curve in terms of what's happening to banks. Look at those buildings with bank names on them. Every one of the CEOs of those banking companies knows they're sitting on a ship that's sinking. And they're trying to figure out what is it that won't sink. Because all the branches are irrelevant. You know, half their employees have to be fired tomorrow, right? I'm not exaggerating. So the impossible journey they have is to go from this incremental thing, we talked, you can't read, that this incremental and sustaining change, going to the next or near markets, right? And jumping into these game changer disruptive markets, it's like almost impossible for them. So you're their solution. So they'll, they used to look at this thing that Hank came up with, this internal funnel, we do stuff, we put it through here, some of it makes it to the market. To this new concept, open innovation, it's been around now for 30 years, that, oh, some of the stuff's internal, but a lot of it's external, and it just doesn't start at the beginning of the funnel, but it might come in at all stages in the funnel. Not a new thought, I wrote the book a long time ago. But it's all about how these different entities stay in the process. So you're probably tired of seeing this curve, but this progression is meant to show you that different entities will participate in this progression at different times. We're here talking all about Enterprise A. Enterprise B is the one that really scales it, and A may become B. Enterprise C is the one that milks it. Doesn't really change it, just rolls it in and incorporates it. So you have to take, there are various examples, but you have to take your enterprise and exactly as counsel explained, structure it with all those agreements. What's the purpose of all those agreements? It's really not to protect you, I would argue. It's to enable this transaction to happen without friction. To enable you to become either personally the company that can scale and exploit or to do business with a partner that will scale and exploit. company has done this the best, perhaps, I think of is Cisco. This is the friendly merger acquisition. Out here, these guys can do a lot of hostile acquisition, where they buy you and fire your CFO and keep your salespeople. Right? We all know that. We've probably been, some of us probably in this room have been through hostile acquisitions, know how that goes. But there's a relationship. The reason what these venture capitalists who are going to sit on our panel are going to explain to us is that there's a relationship that they bring, this knowledge about how the startup can work with a broader context. That part of the skill they bring is not just you know, money, but it's actually having been through this exercise before and understanding the pathway. Pathway may be sale, it may be partnership, it may be distribution agreement. The investor's challenge is knowing that this gold here 
These are all successful exits, and this I could have this chart from any period of time. Nine out of ten successful exits are not IPOs, they're acquisitions. Those aligned to this opportunity are like Larry Ellison, who could have created NetSuite and Salesforce internally because his own executives wanted to do it, and he stifled them, never went to the cloud. Now Oracle's paying catch up, totally. But that he's in that hostile acquisition mode. So I won't take you through this in too much detail, but simply to say you want to identify whether you're, this is the organization and this is your critical mission here, the fit with the core and in support of the core. And where you sit, you're not here, this is internal development. This is the CEO saying, you know, go forth and create. And he has the resources or she has the resources and you create. If you find it outside, go forth and buy and bring it in. But here is the experimentation space where you reside, you complement the core, and you want a chance to get to know them because you have great investors already in your business. They may come in and partner with you on the terms the investors have established, which are going to be more friendly to you than if they came in alone on their own. Having investors because the investors will look at their own selfish interests, will protect you protecting your own selfish interests, right? Because the corporations will not, the investors won't allow the corporations to have senior terms to them. So this is the magic quadrant when you're thinking about dealing with major corporations. I'll tell you a quick story on this and then we'll move directly to valuation. So is this just theory? One of my students uh, helped build a company uh, called Kehoe Software. Had a way to image the world. They were doing it. They were raising money, having some, some success, struggling. Their revenue model was, it was software as a service. They didn't call it that then. It was licenses to real estate developers because real estate developers may want to sit here in Melbourne and say, ah, let's invest in this place in Miami on Collins Avenue. Not Collins Avenue in Melbourne, but Collins Avenue in Miami. I wonder, you know, if uh, location, 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 rather than getting on a plane this afternoon and flying to Miami, if I can quickly visualize what that's like. And this company, Keyhole Software, had a way to quickly visualize, put us on the ground in Miami and take a look at it. Well, their neighbor down the street thought this was compelling, even though it had no revenue model that was relevant to them. And they showed up and bought it, sort of like overnight. So by rate, the, the a message here for entrepreneurs is, when you're, you're always for sale, even though you're never selling. I mean, you're always selling, but you're never for sale, right? Even when you're raising money, essentially, you're saying, at the right price, right? And Google said, oh, these guys are raising money? You know, at the right price, they may exit. And yes, the price was much more of an opportunity for the entrepreneurs than accepting 30, they had a $30 million term sheet, and then accept that they sold. Pre-IPO, Google dollars were good. After years and years, a, a lot of success within Google and becoming in charge of Google Maps, the same team stayed together, spun out a lab within Google that then spun out of the company and became the most popular mobile game ever until Fortnite, which is now the most popular mobile game ever. So it fits, just to give you some, I only bring up that example to show you how when you have a company that's compelling internally, obviously acquisition is the strategy. Sometimes corporations spin out stuff and, op and entrepreneurs can capture that opportunity. And sometimes they preserve a minority interest or invest. So here Google wins. Why? Well, oh, my God, they lost this great asset. Yeah, but they still owned a chunk of it and they had a big operating relationship for the use of their maps and for sales through the um, app store. Okay, so they made a few hundred million dollars in the first six months back, not bad. This company did a billion dollars of revenue in the first six months and spun out. So just a way to shape things in your own mind. So let's move to valuation.
Again, it's about resource acquisition, not strictly value of the transaction. We could talk about what's going on in venture capital. It's relevant only because it sets a global context. What's this slide say? There's a lot of money in the world. This slide tells you the money's all around the world. It's not just in Silicon Valley. The rate of global growth in venture investing is up and to the right. This slide tells you that the participants in the venture space are not just the traditional venture capitalists, but a lot of the private equity guys have oozed into the space. So these are bigger and bigger dollars participating. There's a tremendous amount of dry powder. In other words, people looking for opportunity. The trends are very important that the consistency in the market is at the early stage is really tremendous. This is by geography, and this is North America, and here's Asia and Europe. The point is there's not a lot of volatility. When we look at aggregate, aggregate statistics across the world, you're going to see huge volatility. It's in the later stage transaction. The goal is not to manage growth carefully. The goal is to take a lot of risk and find explosive opportunities. So this kind of management is an anathema to the early stage investor. Not all. I'm sure you will find some early stage investors that want to invest in a small trading company or something that's going to grow 10% a year. Great. That's not what I'm here to talk about. You didn't need to travel to downtown Melbourne to learn about that. This is about creating companies with the potential for global impact. And investors that want to deal with that, again, want entrepreneurs that are looking at the exit as a strategy, not as a way to run away as a way to help them return significant multiples of their money so they can be responsible to their sources of money. The investors often are not really the pocketbook. The pocketbook are large sovereign wealth organizations. They are superannuary funds, pension funds, major corporations who are investing through corporate venture capital. In other words, there's responsibility to third parties. So these guys called venture capitalists are really middlemen. They're market makers. It's different. The angel investors are often investing their own dollars. So they're really different than these market makers, but they know how to relate to these people to leverage that money. The scorecard that measures whether people win or lose in this game is not a scorecard that measures 7% IRR or 13% IRR. It happens to calculate around here in the 40s if you're good, but it's 5x in five years. That's a nominal middle point goal. Returning liquid cash to the investor five times what they gave you in five years. Very few people hit that goal. I'm not saying it's reasonable but it's a good nominal expectation if you want to know what your contract is that you're signing. If you return a higher multiple faster, well, you're, wow, you're something special. You're fantastic. It happens. But the key questions aren't about valuation. They're about how much money do you need? You know, what is the business you're, you're in? How do others see you? That's all about comparables. How big is my opportunity? Can I generate the kind of return that Jerry's talking about in the time frame they require? Or is that just not a possibility for me? Should I not be building a business with that expectation for that kind of investment? Personally, to me, what is success? Personally, to my investors, what is their view of success? Is there a fit? If there's not a fit, don't force it. So there is no absolutely correct value. You say, what is my business worth? When I first met Bob and one of his colleagues, my portfolio companies might ask me, what is my business worth? I had an answer. I would say, say pre-money, you're worth $2 million. And they'd start to tell me about their business. And I'd say, stop. You're worth $2 million. And they'd start to tell me, stop. I don't have the time. You're worth $2 million. They go, oh, no, 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 you don't know enough. Blah, blah, blah. I say, okay, you're not worth $2 million? I'll tell you the other number. Worth nothing. 
My point is, when you look at startups at the earliest stage, and you discount it back for all the risk, there's a limited range of value. It may not be 2 million, it might be 10 million, but it's not 30. It's a, sm it's a relatively small number. And the real issue is whether you're investable or not. If you're investable because you've, your lawyers helped you with the right documents, if you're investable because you have a large enough market, if you're investable because you're a legit person who's trustworthy, et cetera, if you're investable because you have the trust and confidence of your community, if you're investable for that person, that investor, because you're pursuing an opportunity they tend to fit with their view of the world, well, then you can argue about value. But the biggest thing is you're either investable or not. And that's the biggest question. So we will not go into the term sheet. We've heard something about it. But the critical terms, there's going to be some preference given, no matter what structure you're in, to the last dollars in. The outside investors will have an unfair, if you will, advantage over your poor dollars that have been in there and invested for five years and have been burnt to dust and you've been slaving away, nice. Their money comes out first, period. That's called a liquidation preference. Then there's all sorts of other terms. They're there for a reason, and you can structure win-win relationships if you keep them simple. So a lot of my comments will deal with the fact that there are institutional investors, and they're different than angel investors but they work well together. And strategic investors, corporates, are yet different again. And they also can work different, uh, well together. There are attributes that make, oh, you don't want to do that, right? pardon me. There are attributes that will make your business appear more valuable or less valuable. And there are the common sense attributes. I will. To that slide there, please. Thank you. Those, there's nothing there of surprise, right? Big markets are better than small markets. Rapidly growing markets are the best of all, etc. Everybody's got a checklist, so you can go down your checklist of things that impact valuation. But the comparables is what drives value. It's what business are you in? What business? You know, do people think you're in? Are they going to define you by the application of your technology, or are they going to define you by the capability that you're bringing? Are they going to define you along given frameworks? We've discussed these. Are they going to define you on novel frameworks? Or are they going to define you against their own frameworks for you, their own lens that they bring, that they're looking at, they're specializing not in sports tech, but in IoT, let's say and you're an application of IoT, and they're going to comp you against other IoT opportunities. So this question about where you fit in comparability, the question about where you fit in the market map is the question. We're going to look at a couple cases real quickly, and one of them is going to be this little company right here, Yard Barker, which is in the media and content space, and in the crossover between collegiate and professional. So again, it's positioning, positioning, positioning. All right, so I'm an investor in this little company I want to talk to you about. And being an investor, angel investor, one of the first guys in, business is just scratching and clawing to be successful. You know, I was able to ask the CEO, hey, give me some thoughts. I'm going to talk to people in Melbourne. Give me two slots. And you know, he said, sure, I got some thoughts. Let me share. And his view, and he's in the sports space, all right? So his view, his name's Hanny. Let's call him by his name, H-A-N-Y. Hanny's view was that there's all sorts of ways to look at the space. You know, sports teams, blah, 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 blah. Fine. Sports industry is global, all this self-promotion stuff that would help him in his argument. And he put up some great examples, you know, that come out of either, you know, people, you know, specializing in the 
uh, incubator space, people specializing investment firms that are specializing in the space. And thanks to Hani, I know that you know, these companies have these investors. Now, this should be an important slide to you, because look what's happening here. Stephen Ross has this investment firm. He's the Dolphins owner. This guy's the Dodgers owner. You know, this guy's an NFL player, and this guy's an NFL star, this guy's an NBA star. You know, Kevin Durant, Aaron Rodgers, I don't know if you know these names. These people are people I live and die for, right? Uh, I mean, but these people, I remember when, this name up here, I got Aaron Rodgers, Serena Williams, Aaron Rodgers, Kevin Durant. Okay, I remember that there are many more names than that, because I remember when uh, the quarterbacks of the 49ers successively, Steve Young and his predecessor, I should be embarrassed. I'm sorry? Montana, right, exactly. Uh, you know, they both set up their own venture firm. And I remember when they did it, and I thought, oh, these sports guys are just going to lose their shirt, right? And you know what? People like to co-invest with sports heroes. And these guys have had great returns in individual set their own funds. These funds are not trivial exercises. This is very serious. On the investor side, sports investors have become a very serious category of large global investors. Believe me, these people have capacity, not only personally, I mean, they're making tons of money, but they can attract institutional investors to their funds. They have proven track record. So this is a whole new you know, category of venture capital firms. OK, you can't read it. I apologize. That says that's Lita Ed. This is the company I invested in, OK? Now, What's sports tech about this, and why did I invest? Okay? And what, what's that have to do with valuation? It's simply distance learning. Okay, this is an old story. Distance learning, you know, that's a five-year-old story, right? We have great successes, Coursera, uh, others in distance learning. But this is specifically distance learning, teaching athletes or people that aspire to be athletes about the business of sports. So this is, these are courses that will be taught either remotely or co-jointly on campus to student athletes who are distracted from their education because they have to be you know, everywhere in the world with these teams that now are 12-month 12, 12 exercise. It used to be there was a season and not the season, and they'd go to school for the six months and then be an athlete for six months. It doesn't work that way anymore. These athletes are athletes first and students second. So we have a whole generation, may not be true in Australia, but in the United States, we have massive population of great young people going through higher education and not getting a relevant education because they're taking basket weaving instead of taking accounting. So we're going to teach them accounting through the lens of sports. In other words, if you're a sports enterprise, how do you do accounting in the sports business? So we're going to make it relevant, and then we're going to offer it in a distance format. So yes, there'll be a few classes in the classroom, but most of them will be available anywhere in the world at any time that those athletes can consume that knowledge. I love the idea, because I'm very empathetic with these students that are striving to get an education. We promise them an education, and then we make them go to practice all the time. So I made an investment, and that's my passion for it. That's what makes this an angel investment rather than, you know, for me, a venture capital investment. But the next round is going to be, you know, Kevin Durant or somebody like that who says, yeah, that happened to me. I'm not going to let that happen to somebody else, right? This one, you can't read it. I'll try, because that's a link, and I don't have the time to send you to Second Spectrum, right? But there's a business right here in the room that's somewhat like this. Where's my drone visual capture? Capture company, I won't embarrass you, but where are you? You're here. You didn't leave. Okay, they won't admit it. They said they were skunk works or something. But there's a business here in the room that's doing something very similar to this, which is they're capturing a uh, you know a experience, right, that's going on, and they're 
creating the analytics in the moment, right? And what this company happens to be doing is moving that in through uh, a user, ex enriched user experience, right? So the way you view the game would be different. You'd be capturing analytics. You, as just a guy or a gal, would be capturing analytics immediately. And, and the reason I say it's somewhat like the business that's in the room here is because the business that's in the room is going to use some methodology I won't disclose because I think that was they felt proprietary, you know, to capture this information, and then they're going to turn it into analytics for coaches to use. So the market was not going to be a user experience, so but we're going to be enriched coaching. So yard barker. So how do these relate to valuation? Yard barker might help us. This is a company that was founded out of one of my parents, just so I have an emotional attachment to it. And I called the, the founder literally last week because I said, hey, I'm going down to Melbourne. And didn't I remember you did something we now call sports tech? We didn't call it sports tech at the time. At the time, it was simply, uh, what's the, oh, the year will show up for us. But I think it's about seven years ago. And all he did essentially was aggregate sports blogs. The people at the time were beginning to do their personal sports blog. And he aggregated them and published them under one umbrella. They still published them independently. But they could place advertising. He aggregated advertising and ran it on this platform and then allowed the advertisers to also choose to run it down on the blog as here. So it's a media company. So it's all about sports. So these are your bloggers. This is the problem. One-way sports media, blah, blah, blah. It's all going to be up and to the right. This is a demo of how we do it. Here's the value proposition for bloggers and for users and for athletes. They're going to control their own publicity. This is before we all had tw Twitter didn't exist yet, right? So now everybody does it on Twitter. Um, here's a Pete. Pete's my student. Jack's my student. These other guys I didn't know. Oh, Russ, I knew he was a partner at Kleiner Perkins, but he invested in this personally. Oh, and it's 2007, 2008 is the time frame. Uh, here's our technology. Here's how we get users. These kids are still in school when they're doing this. This is our revenue model. We get a share of something. Uh, you know, this is who is you with us and against us. Well, we're always up and to the right. I mean, you never believe that, right? Because the metrics are phony. And you know, he, but here's what we're going to do. And here's our numbers. And here's our plan. Well, gee, they said gross revenue. This is always ridiculous. Like, look at the hockey stick. They're going to do nothing. And then next to nothing. And oh my God, out of nowhere, they're going to do you know what 10x. And 5x, and you know, but that's the kind of growth I was talking about needing to get that kind of expert expertise because these kids definitely didn't know how to manage that. And the outcome is okay, they actually raised some money. Um, it, this is your typical friends and family, this is your typical angel round. Still, these numbers I think would be comfortable for you guys, right? And here's your typical series A, B, C round. So, this is still. You know, a typical financing. The outcome of this is they fought the wars, and they were able to sell this thing after five rounds of financing. It wasn't easy. I don't know what they sold for. That's your question. It was all proprietary. It's part of Fox New, uh, the Fox Sports thing. It's rebranded. I guess they sold it for somewhere between fifty and eighty million. Right. But this is the, an example of sports tech and a real ladder going back. When you look at comps, my point here is you look at comps, and this was just called a media play at the time, but it's sports tech. If you did it today, so Overwatch, anybody familiar with Overwatch? OK. This is what it's about. No, up and to the right, up and to the right. It's about teams doing esports. And you can invest in the teams, or you can invest in the platform. So this is where this sort of a, so Pete Vasilica, the same guy, you know, is running this. So you can see that same mentality of user acquisition, minimizing churn, customer retention through media, now being played on a much bigger, bigger dimension. And this is actually a picture of, you know, 22,000 people in attendance to watch other people play video games recognizing that most of it's being done online. This is just the physical presence of the people. 
So this was just a deep look at taking media. I took education, which is media applied in a narrow niche. I took Yard Barker, which is broad-based blogging. And now I took it to eSports, but teased it down to the media observation of eSports. And just that has tremendous depth and acceleration. So the sector you're looking at, we're getting back to the discussion of comparables and valuations. The sector you're looking at matters. And these are the dominant sectors in sports technology. Wearables and equipment, news and content, fantasy sports and betting, and eSports. Here's the numbers. When you break it down over time, right, you sort of say over the last five years, and these are five-year elements, you see there's no consistency to that, that that idea of sectors has to be put against time to have relevancy. If you're going to be doing comps, and you're doing comps and news and content, gee, it looked like it was important, but it was important two years ago. Nobody's doing it anymore. What people are doing is IoT and eSports, content and gambling is on the decline. So your comparable is not just your, your sector, but your sector in time. And what you care about is not just today, but where it's going to be in three years. Because that's when your critical financings are going to happen. Your critical financings are not going to happen today. These guys are not going to do your critical financing. They're going to love you or hate you. They're going to invest in you or not invest in you based on some fundamentals. But your critical financing is going to be that Series B financing where you're trying to raise $20 million. And that's generally going to come from a global marketplace if you're going to get the kind of valuation and structure you want. And when I say these guys, I'm sorry to characterize, but these fantastic angel investors and early stage local investors are going to help you get to these global markets. I know they are, because I know two of these gentlemen fairly well, because I see them in San Francisco. They, part of what they do is to know a global context for investing, and that's what your investors, early stage investors, should bring to you. So there's chaos, there's chaos, but guess what? Even if I look back to the early days, bingo! I didn't put Australia in the middle of that map. Somebody else did, some third party, whoever the source of this was, whoever Tableau is, I went searching for data. So sports tech and Australia already has significant re resonance, right? Here are all the places where the, there have been measurable transactions. Bingo, I don't know that business, you may know that business. But you're on the map, you know, you, your community is relevant and is noticed. So this valuation discussion we've had has been more about positioning you than it has about a calculation. And it's positioning you for a discussion of fit. Does your world of markets and cash flows and capital structure you know, fit what a regular company looks like. Because your world is really going to have negative cash flows. Your capital structure may actually be more complex than a big company because you're going to have preferred stock and common stock. Your market's not going to necessarily be an established market, but it's going to be a highly, rapidly growing emerging market. So you actually have a lot of complexity. And having somebody come in and do a valuation of your business Paying somebody five or ten or twenty thousand dollars to value your business is a joke because the experts know how to do this. They don't know how to do this. The guys here at the table know how to do this because they put their own money behind it. So a lot of things impact the value you're going to agree to. Company specific, what we call the cap table, the ownership structure, your expected future and qualitative characteristics. It might have as much to do with outside the company as inside the company. And then, of course, the potential for chaos that may come from the outside. The investor has their own set of characteristics. They may be in good health or bad health financially. Their portfolio may be in good health or bad health. They may have positioning issues of their own in the marketplace. They may want to demonstrate that they're active in certain markets. 
So there's all sorts of issues that have nothing to do with you that will affect whether you're an attractive investment. So like there's no single valuation answer, there's never a perfect fit. So your discussions that you have are important because they're going to reflect, there's no absolute truth, they're going to reflect the effort to achieve an agreement about what can work for both of you, how to achieve fit. And that's going to involve shared expectations around a business plan, financing plan, and liquidity class, around valuation and deal terms, and around governance. Who's on the board? How do you make decisions? So with that, I'd like to invite the panel up, if I may. And I'm going to ask the panel to introduce themselves. You guys ready? Bob Beaumont, if you would take your seat. Jordan Green, Joe Barber, would you join me, please? 